is the story of Miriam and her friends who were so excited and so confident about their future that they packed up their musical instruments, their drums and their tambourines, and they schlepped those drums and their tambourines out of Egypt and across that sea. Even as she was running for her life, Miriam was thinking about the tools that she would need for celebration on the other side the tools that she would use to sing and to dance and to spread joy and wonder when her people were finally free. Because despite the fear, Miriam believed that she would get there, that the sea would part and that she and her friends and her community would celebrate. She knew that the journey would not end there, however, that on the other shore of the sea, there would be other triumphs to work toward, there would be other challenges to face. That it is an endless journey of many meals and celebrations and rallies and bills and commandments and amendments and sea crossings. Our work too will not end next week, not next month and not next year. We will need our food and we will also need our musical instruments. You and I will create the equality and the justice that we dream of. You and I will change the trajectory of this past four years. It means not giving into the fears and not slowing down. It means continuing to dream and carrying not only our bread, our essential bread, but also our drums, our essential drums, our essential spirit. Being prepared to nurture both our bodies and our souls and our communities and our nation as we enter into this next phase of this long, long marathon to true, profound, necessary justice. And so we say once again, Makor HaChayim, source of all life. May we have the strength and the support and the will to continue to press forward in these days, no matter how difficult these next moments, these next weeks, these next hours become. May we have the wisdom to know that this journey is never really over. May we elevate the truths that we hold so dear through our actions and through our voices and through our votes. And may we remember to gather our drums and our tambourines so that we may sing and we may dance and we may be celebrate as we move our future forward, creating the future, the hope, the possibility, the lives that we all dream of. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rabbi Coburn. Um, and thank you for being with us uh, in this journey uh, from the very beginning. You and your congregation uh, there in Denver, we, uh, we really appreciate your leadership. I want to thank my good friend, uh, the Reverend Adam Phillips as well, who uh, is uh, the Executive Director of Faith 2020. And then welcome our special guests, uh, the Reverend Gabriel Segaro, uh, as well as the Reverend Dr. William Barber. I'm going to introduce uh, both of them, Reverend Dr. Segaro first, and then Reverend William Barber. I'm going to do it all at the same time. Uh, and then we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Salgaro. And then after Dr. Salgaro, we'll hear from Bishop Barber. And then with the time we have remaining, we'll open up for a few questions from uh, the folks who signed on to be with us today. Uh, and uh, we realized that uh, we have a hard stop right at one o'clock so that uh, Reverend Barbara can, uh, I think, uh, 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 actually travel today, as I understand it. So we're really pleased to have uh, all of you with us. And we're really, uh, really, really honored to have these two uh, moral giants in the nation's prophetic voices in the nation to be with us. So let me first introduce to you, I present to you, because we all know both of, both of these, uh, both of these men, but let me present to you uh, both uh, uh, Dr. Sagaro and, uh, and Dr. Barber. The Reverend Dr. Gabriel Sagaro uh, and his wife, Reverend uh, Jeanette Sagaro, are pastors of the Gathering Place. The Gathering Place is a Christ-centered gospel community that actively participates in the Spirit's transformation and believes that God's kingdom is at work around the world. And as such, the gathering place is hopeful about the church, our lives, our cities, and our world. Dr. Scarrow is also the president and founder of the National Latino Evangelical Coalition, NILAC, 
a coalition of several thousand evangelical congregations in the United States. He was the former director of the Hispanic Leadership Program um, and the Institute for Faith and Public Life at Princeton Theological Seminary. Dr. Salgaro is also a powerful voice on issues that affect the approximately 9 million Latino evangelicals in the United States. Dr. Salgaro's leadership of NILAC offers an important, important moral voice for the entire nation. And now Dr. Uh, and Bishop William Barber. The Reverend Dr. William Barber II is the president and senior lecturer of Repairs of the Breach, co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, bishop with the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries, and visiting professor at the Union Theological Seminary in New York City. We're so proud to have him with us. Pastor of Greenleaf Christian Church, the Disciples of Christ Church in Goldsboro, North Carolina, and the author of four books. We are called to be a movement, revive us again, a vision in action and moral organizing. The third reconstruction, how a moral movement is overcoming the politics of division and fear and forward together, a moral message for the nation. It's only appropriate that we should end with that as we talk about uh, the issues of morality and ethics and compassion for the nation. And we'll hear first from Dr. Segarra, then from Bishop Barber, and then uh, some Q&A for the time that we have. Dr. Segarro, welcome. We're so glad you're with us. Thank you, Reverend Davey and Reverend Phillips. And of course, my new friend, Rabbi Rachel, whose uh, namesake my mom also has over there in Denver, Colorado. And of course, the Reverend Dr. Bishop William Barber, uh, who needs no introduction. I'm so honored to be with all of you this afternoon, if it's an afternoon when you're chiming in, or morning if you're on the West Coast or whatever part of the country you're in. Receive un saludo hermanable de nuestros hermanos y nuestras hermanas latinas en los Estados Unidos. Somos casi 60 millones. Receive a greeting. Uh, from our Hispanic brothers and sisters from around the country. We're a little over 60 million Latinos living in the United States. One out of every four babies born in the United States is Hispanic, and one out of every two is a child of color. And so Aslan is on the move to quote C.S. Lewis. And so in the, in the next few minutes uh, that I have to reflect on this year's election and why I'm asking people to vote I've already voted. I live in the great state of Florida, in Orlando, Florida, which is a quintessential swing state and often determinative in presidential elections. And so I voted early and I waited in line for over an hour uh, to vote and other people waited several hours. And the reason I'm, I'm telling people to get out the vote is I think out of a phrase from C.S. Lewis, uh, when the children, two, two girls and two boys, asked Mr. Tumnus, who was, who was now in my interpretation, he was, he was Latino, Mr. Tumnus, because he was half fawn, half Narnian. He was a hybrid, like many of us who are immigrants in this country or, or who live in the hybridity or the hyphen. America has a legacy, a mixed legacy on immigration. It has Emma Lazarus telling us, bring me your poor, your tired, your huddled masses yearning to be free in that great poem called The New Colossus on the Feet of Lady Liberty but it also has the Chinese Exclusion Act. It has separating children on the frontiers, on the borders of El Paso and the Rio Grande Valley. It has uh, the incarceration of immigrant children. It, it has the exclusion of immigrants uh, from the Chinese Exclusion Act to, to when Irish came uh, early on in America. And of course, our tragic legacy of segregation and chattel slavery and of course, how could we miss the Native American genocide? And so we have a mixed legacy and the children ask Mr. Tumnus who lives in the hybridity, he's both of Narnia and from beyond Narnia. What time is it? What time is it in Narnia? And that's the question we have to ask ourselves as we push these last few days to get out the vote. Que hora es? What time is it in America? And Mr. Tumnus responds to the children. He says, children, it's winter. It's winter in America. 
He says it's winter, but never Christmas. And so to be interreligious, I'll say it's winter and never, never Hanukkah or winter and never Christmas and winter and never Kwanzaa. What he's saying is we have all of the storms of winter, all of the blizzards of winter, but none of the celebrations from our religious holidays that come with winter. And that's how many of our people are feeling. It's winter in America. But I, like the prophet, the Hebrew prophet Zephaniah, am a prisoner of hope. I believe that the winds are changing and that you and I have to co-labor with the zeitgeist. Nuestra voz y nuestro voto cuenta. Our vote and our voice counts. And although there are pressures to have a Christmas without a Kwanzaa and a Hanukkah and all of the festivities that come with it, some of us are pushing in the other direction. The blizzards of disenfranchisement, the blizzards of the marginalizations of immigrant people, the blizzards of racialized policing, the, the blizzards that try to redline some of us out of good housing, they will not have the last word. The prophet continues to say to the prisoners of hope, God sings songs of victory over you. And I submit to you that I'm here this afternoon, this morning, if you're in another part of the country, with these distinguished women and men and with all of you, because God wants us to sing songs, as the rabbi clearly noted, con la pandereta, el tambor, el guido y la guitarra, songs that change the wind a new anthem that says people can no longer be disenfranchised. We can no longer profile people because of the color of their sin, skin and interpret it as sin. We can no longer keep people in jail by these laws that make being economically disenfranchised a sin. We can no longer say and turn a blind eye to immigrant children coming from the Northern Triangle of Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, and then say, oops, we can't find 540 of their parents. It's winter, but the winds are changing. And God is raising a melodious, multi-ethnic, multi-racial, multi-generational revolution to turn, as Dr. King would say, the jangling discords of this country into a sy symphony of brotherhood and sisterhood. So I voted, my wife voted, people in our congregation went out to get to vote. The National Latino Evangelical Coalition did a national voting drive because we refuse to say there will be a winter without the festivities of change. And so what time is it? It's time to change the wind. What time is it? It's time for our voices to be heard. ¿Qué hora es? Es hora para una coalición multiracial, multietnica y multireligiosa que cambie los vientos. It is time for a multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multi-generational coalition to say that America can live up, as Abraham Lincoln said, to the highest and noblest angels of our spirit. And we can, and we ought to form a more perfect union. There are voices who would prey on our disunity, who would prey on our fears. St. Paul told Timothy, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, of power, and of a sound mind. And so if you haven't voted yet, if you haven't encouraged your community to vote, Remember that that prophetess Tina Turner asked the question, what's love got to do with it? Well, love has everything to do with it. Uh, Dr. Barber liked that one. He, I, saw, I saw him crack a smile. <laughs> love has everything to do with it. And in this election, we're gonna vote love. We're gonna vote justice. We're gonna vote mercy. We're gonna vote grace. We're gonna vote racial reconciliation. We're gonna vote economic empowerment. We're gonna vote all those things that make us the very best that we can be.
One last thing uh, as, as I close. Miguel de Unamuno, the famous Spanish poet, quoting from a great rabbi. ¿Qué hora es? What time is it? ¿Y quién lo va a hacer? And who's going to do it? He quoting from the rabbi, he says, if not you, who? And if not now, when? We, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters who seek the tikkun olam, the shalom, la paz, el salam, we who seek a more perfect union, we are the ones we've been waiting for. If we don't vote, if we don't speak, if we don't march, if our anthem is not, ain't gonna let nobody turn me round, turn me round, turn me round. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me round. Gonna keep on a walking, keep on a talking, voting down that freedom lane. And so now could be our finest hour if we choose to be courageous, because courage is in high demand and in low supply. But you are the ones that you've been waiting for. So there's a Esther, there's a Hadassah, there's a Daniel, there's a Joseph. There are people all over this country, all over this nation, who've been waiting to say, this winter we're gonna have festivity. And truth and justice will have the last word. And let me just finish with this. And thank you again, my dear sister and brothers and all those who are on the line. The famous son of a Pentecostal preacher who became a well-known singer, Marvin Gaye. He asked the question. It's a question that every faith leader, every person of goodwill, Every person, black, white, Latino, Native American, immigrant, resident, alien, citizen should ask, what's going on? And what's going on? If we don't vote justice, if we don't vote mercy, it will continue to be winter. But I am a prisoner of hope. And I believe spring is coming. And there will be a resurrection of a justice city of poor people empowered and enfranchised, of immigrants singing the songs of a new earth. Y tu hermano, y tu hermana, you sister, you brother, are a part of that. Thank you, and Hashem, God, Dios te bendiga. Thank you, Dr. Segaro, for that powerful, powerful, powerful word. It's really appreciated, Martin. Mar uh, Marvin Gaye, after saying what's going on, he said, the way they do my life. And uh, you want to, you're calling us to vote and do justice so that the way, the way they do his life and the lives of the millions and millions of people in this country is one of compassion uh, rooted in justice. And we appreciate your call and your encouragement uh, to all of us uh, to get out and vote and to be engaged and involved in making this world um, a better place. So thank you. Thank you for that word and thank you for your leadership. I'm now gonna turn to my friend um, and leader, uh, the Reverend Dr. Bishop uh, William Barber, uh, Dr. Barber. Well, you know, I don't trust prophetic voices that don't know Tina Turner and Marvin Gaye, so. I want y'all to know the Holy Ghost has sanctified my trust this morning. I was wondering who this guy was. And, and uh, but when he said he quoted Marvin Gaye and engaged in what we call field musicology, <laughs> I said, now that's a real prophet right there. That's a real preacher. And uh, I'm also Pentecostal enough to know when you need prayer. If you all think I'm gonna jump right in that, I think really that's all that needs to be said. I have a few passing comments. But I've got this apostolic in the room with me, Reverend Dr. Della Owens. And she was over here just amen and hallelujah. And she's security. We're on our way to DC. Come here, Reverend Della. And I want her to give a prayer 
because I'm not, you can't, I know I'm breaking protocol, but y'all ask me. So you've got all of me. <laughs> That's all right, Reverend, go ahead. I don't know what it is to have me is I, I don't, I'm not one of these preachers that just because the announcements on the program, you're supposed to say them, but the right song is sung. Sometimes you don't do the announcements. Uh, uh, you, you move with the spirit. So Reverend, come in, just, just open a word of prayer, if you would, based on what you heard just then from my dear brother. Amen. So I've been caught on the spot here. That's all right. You read it. Um, but yes, I was definitely listening in to what has been said. And I will just briefly add prayers uh, this morning. Oh, gracious God, we humble ourselves before you as your servants. And we pray, God, that everyone that is listening on today will be stirred, their consciousness stirred to move Lord, in a very powerful way to activate their voices at the ballot box, God, that they will be stirred in such a way, God, that they understand that they must speak by using the power of their vote, the power of their voices to bring about change because your word does tell us faith without works is surely dead. And so God, we thank you now that you are stirring us to move in such a way that we will be the leaders, that we will be, God, the examples of those who have said, I will not be still in this moment, that I will stand up for justice and speak for righteousness. God, we thank you now for what you are doing in this moment, that you are calling us as your people of a mind to be conscious, to be alert, and God, that we will be your boots on the ground to, sp to spread justice, to move, God, the compass of God of justice in our community, in this nation. And so we thank you, God. We pray for a special, a supernatural anointing to fall on us, oh God. In the name of Jesus, we thank you. We praise you for all that you have done and that you will do through us and through this program. In your holy name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. There comes a time you have to know. I don't know what happened to my picture. Can you all still see and hear me? Yes, we've okay. got you. I am... Um, wanted Reverend Della to do that because she has just spent six days at the polls, working the polls. And she has seen some interesting things. Uh, she saw an African-American man with slippers on come in and ask for the ballot to vote for Trump. She saw an elderly white woman dressed in an entire flag, everything she had was on, it was a flag, her suit, her glasses, her hairdo, everything. And she asked for a ballot to vote for Biden. She said, if I had just judged a book by its cover, I would have never thought that I would have seen that reality. Indeed, Reverend Gabriel, we are in interesting times. And the three things I wanna simply lift up is that <clears throat> We are not spectators and cannot be spectators in this democracy. We must turn now from talking about what folk have done to us, but what we must do. And particularly as people of faith, we have to be careful. I've heard some people of faith say things like, uh, the president is the most powerful person in the world. Well, what are you if you're a person of faith? And when did an elected person, I don't care if Democrat or Republican, how do they the most powerful person in the world if they have to be elected, they can't even hold the office without you. Uh, people are already trying to go to November 5th. Why don't, let's focus on November 3rd. Let's get that first work done as the Bible said. If you focus on that first work and you vote, uh, uh, it's not so much all these scenarios about what somebody can do we're talking about us. Uh, we are not called to be moral spectators. Now, part of what we this vote has to mean for us this time is we got to vote a vote of repentance first. 
because the truth of the matter is we talk about all this death now in COVID, but I want us to be careful not to think, not to just teach that things got bad after COVID. For poor folk, whether they be white, black, or Latino, or indigenous, things were bad before COVID. 140 million people living in poverty. 43% uh, of this country, Liz, Theo Harris, my co-chair and I talk about this all the time. And that's why the Poor People's Campaign in June of this year, we gathered uh, 2.7 million people online for a mass Poor People's Assembly moral march on Washington. But we've been organizing for years saying that, you, that this nation has been ignoring the plight of the poor. And let's be real, let's be real. You, you know, for the last 30 years, the conversation has been about middle class and about the wealthy. And that actually sets us up for demagoguery to win because people start feeling abandoned. When it, but, but then also we found out in the data that poor and low wealth people tend to vote progressive. But the problem is many of them just don't vote because they're not talked to. And so one of the things we have to have is a series of repentance because things were bad before COVID. 140 million people living in poverty, 700 people are dying a day from poverty. Seven people died from fracking, I mean, from vaping before COVID. We had a White House meeting and a, and a congressional hearing. 700 people dying a day from poverty and we've never had a congressional hearing or White House executive order. At 87 million people with or without insurance or underinsured before COVID. Four million people get up every day and buy unleaded gas and can't buy unleaded water before COVID. And so when COVID hit, the fissures of racism, systemic racism, because before COVID, not just police brutality, but before COVID, we had, we had um, 26 states that engaged in massive voter suppression before COVID. What COVID has done is expose the fissures, but it's also said that part of what this vote has to mean and why we have to vote now is to say we will no longer be moral spectators. This vote must say we are, we, we are in, particularly the church and particularly the, 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 the mosque and particularly the synagogue, we are in and we are never going to step out again. We're never going to step back again. This vote, in a real sense, has to say we are not Going, moral spectators, because if we res, remain moral spectators, then what happens is the country gets overtaken by necropolitics, the politics of death, who lives and who dies. You know, my daughter raised this for me the other night, and she said, after one of the debates, she said, Daddy, 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 I just need to say something to you. She said, I need you to say, do something. And I said, what is it? She said, daddy, they're talking about killing me. That's what this election is about. I said, what are you? She said, I have, you know, I was born with a brain disorder. I had to have brain surgery and I'm doing well now, but I have a pre-existing condition and I need insurance and I need the right to have insurance. And somebody is thinking about addressing or not addressing the issue of insurance there are people who get up in the morning, they don't even know me, and yet they're trying to kill me. We cannot be moral spectators. When even our children can see there's something deadly is going on with our politics, and particularly those who believe, as the Jewish writers said in the Bible, the power of life and death is in the tongue, or those of us who in the Gospels believe that the God we serve has come that we might have life and that more abundantly. We cannot be moral spectators when Pharaoh-like and Caesar-like attitudes are, are in our politics. You cannot be ambivalent when Pharaoh is around. <laughs> you cannot be ambivalent when Caesar is around. It is actually sinful to merely be a moral spectator. And, uh, and, and, and this, that this vote is really about people's lives. We can't be moral spectators. I want somebody to grab that. We cannot be moral spectators in every nonviolent way we must speak. And that leads to another point. We, we are not without political strength. We are not without political strength. People of faith have to be the main ones that say to people 
Goliath may be big, but we are not without strength. The cross may be great, but we are not without strength. We're not without strength. We're, we're not, there, there are three strengths that we have. First of all, we have our voice. And I'm going to ask the rabbi just to nod her head if I'm wrong. I might be wrong, but, but if I am, the rabbi has told me this. So you all got me all messed up. And that is that, that the rabbis have taught me that in Hebrew, the word for vote and voice is the same word, kol, K-U-L. She, she's shaking her head. So, so your vote is your voice, and your vote is your, you know, and your vote is your voice, and your voice is your vote. And that many times in the Bible, when God speaks call, it sounds like thunder, right? Or when the prophets speak on behalf of God, it creates change. So we have, we are not without strength. We have voice. We have voice. We have anointed voice. We must give voice to justice. We must give voice to those who are hurting. When we have the microphone, it's not about speaking for ourselves. We have to speak for all of those who, 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 who are suffering. That's why I, I, I raise wherever I go the people who have lost their children or who have died unnecessarily. We have to, one preacher said, we have to turn people's ears into eyes <laughs> so they can see. And we have to speak with an authority. We have to say that, that anybody that's trying to suppress your vote is participating in a form of blasphemy, in a form of sin, because God gave us our voices and God gave us the ability to make choice. And in this culture, we only give the right to vote to, to persons 18 years old, born or naturalized in these United States. We don't give the right to vote to parakeets and parakeets, pups and puppies and pets. So when you try to suppress my vote, you're suggesting I'm not a person. I'm less than a person. And I cannot allow that. We are not without strength. Then we have, our vote itself is strength. Our vote is strength. We need to stop saying that extremism in this country, the truth of the matter, I hear people all the time on TV saying, this state is red, this state is blue. Well, a lot of times what they are are states that just don't vote, where the votes have been suppressed, where people have been pushed down. The truth of the matter is right now, for instance, God has fixed it so that the stones that the builders have rejected have become the chief cornerstone of a new democracy. Do you know the only place you can expand the vote right now really is among poor and low wealth people? Do you know poor and low wealth people control now 30% of the voting bloc in this country? That's 64 million people that can vote. Last time only 29 million voted, 34 million didn't vote. We just released a study called Unleashing the Power of Poor and Low Wealth Votes. And we asked three big questions. Why didn't people vote? We did it with the scholar from Columbia. And the first reason was they said, because nobody ever talks about our issues. The second reason was they can't get off work and transportation. The third reason was voter suppression. So we've been going around in the country and saying, well, if they're not talking about your issues, then you must make them hear you. And one of the ways we make people hear us is voting. The, point, the fact of the matter is all of the rejected people outweigh, outnumber those that have done the rejection. <laughs> we have power, our vote is power. In 15 states right now, Reverend Gabriel, if poor and low wealth people vote between one and 19% higher than they did last time, they outdistance the margin of victory in presidential and Senate races. Think about that now. Michigan is only 1%. All you need is 1%. You don't need 2%, 3%, 10%. Just 1% of poor and low wealth people to vote and vote for their lives. In North Carolina, it's 19%. In Texas, it's less than 11%. In, in Mississippi, it's around 9%. In most states, it's under 7%. In Florida, it's only 5%. The margin of victory in the presidential election last time was only 105,000 uh, votes. The number of poor and low wealth people that didn't vote last time is somewhere around 2.5 million people. In the three states from Wisconsin to Michigan to Pennsylvania, where 80,000 votes determined who would sit in the president, in the office of president because of the electoral college, 2.6 million poor and low wealth people didn't even vote. So my brothers and sisters, those of us that have pulpits and places, you don't even have to tell people how to vote. I, I trust that people know how to vote. We just have to make sure they vote and get them out and help them and inspire them because we have, our votes have power now. The stones that the builders rejected 
are now the possibility of the new cornerstone in a new architecture of America. And we got to say to folk, we got to vote because they have five issues, systemic racism and all of its forms from how it affects black people, brown people, indigenous people, <clears throat> systemic poverty, ecological devastation, the war economy, for the for false moral narrative of religious nationalism, those five interlocking injustices are trying to suffocate our democracy and we must breathe. And one of the ways we breathe is through our votes. I said in 2013, we must be the moral defibrillators and shock the heart of this nation. And we have to stop talking as though we're weak. We are not without political strength. And then we're not without vision. That's a strength. Because voting is not just voting and going home, not just voting for a personality. Our votes this time must be, I'm voting because I believe that we can have a world where everybody makes a living wage. I'm voting because I believe we can have a world and a country where everybody has adequate health care. I'm voting because I believe that we can tear down these concentration camps is what I call them, just holding Latinos and stop building walls and stop bridging, building bridges. I'm voting because I know we don't have to have police brutality and racialized killing. I'm voting because I believe we can fully fund public education and we can, in fact, make sure that everybody makes a living wage. I'm voting because we can make sure there is adequate housing for those that do not have housing. I'm voting because I believe we can have just immigration policy for our immigration brother, our, our Latino brothers and sisters and others coming from predominantly people of color countries. I'm voting because I believe we can finally fulfill the promises that were broken with the indigenous people. I'm voting because I, believe we can adjust the war economy. I'm voting because I believe we can, in fact, uh, address ecological devastation. I'm voting because I believe that the way of God is the way of truth and the way of justice and the way of good news to the poor. Our vote, we, we, we have strength. We have strength in our voice. We have strength in our vote. And we have strength in our vision. And then finally, we are not called to run from struggle. We are not called to run from struggle. In fact, the truth of the matter is people of faith are called to run to struggle. In the Old Testament, the Bible says, when the spirit of the God is on you, you feel like you can, you can, you can leap walls and run through troops. <laughs> In the Bible, it says one can chase a thousand and 10 can put 10,000, two can put 10,000 to flight. The Bible says we walk by faith and not by sight. The Bible says, the Lord is my salvation. Whom shall I fear? When the Bible in Isaiah says, it says, they, woe unto those who legislate evil and rob the poor of their rights and make women and children that pray, Isaiah 10, Woe means stop, but it means somebody has to have the courage to go say stop. Jeremiah 22, God told Jeremiah, go down to the king's palace. Don't send a text. Don't send a, a smoke signal. Go down there. Don't be afraid. We run to struggle. We go and meet Goliath on the battlefield. We run to struggle. We pick up our cross and head down to Vea de la Rosa because of the joy that's set before us. We, we, we move by faith. We're born for struggle. We don't run from struggle. This is, this is the hour for people of faith. This is the time to show what we believe and in whom we believe and, and, and what we will never bow to because bowing down is not an option, Mr. Nebuchadnezzar. It doesn't matter if Nebuchadnezzar comes out on his porch and surveys and says, look at what all that I have built and how great I have made America, I mean Babylon. It does not matter. No matter what fiery furnace you throw us in, we, we know God could keep us out of the fiery furnace, but, but even if it doesn't, bowing down is not an option. And in our courage, you know, that's really what the word inspiration means. It means to inspire spirit. And I looked at it epistemologically, it means to inspire courage. 
That's what inspiration means. It doesn't mean you just feel good. It means you get courage to do good. <laughs> and now is the time. Now is the time. Right now, this moment, the spirit of the Lord must be upon us. You know, when Jesus preached that sermon, Caesar was on the throne. <laughs> he preached that sermon that there were all kinds of religious leaders that were, 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 had decided to give in to the state. Can you imagine what, how that would have sounded in the first century? when Caesars were on the throne and they had decided that, 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 that the poor were, were disposable in a culture where all that mattered was greed and the lust for power. And here comes this brown-skinned Palestinian Jewish brother talking about the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he hath anointed me to preach good news to the poor. And the word he used for poor there that's translated in Greek is patokos those who have been made poor by economic exploitation. Can you imagine how that released me? I understand, Reverend Gabriel, why they didn't wait to try to kill him. They tried to kill him that day. People forget that's the rest of that scripture. They tried to kill Jesus that day. They tried to throw him off the cliff, but God protected him because he had work to do. But imagine what that sounded like. And so we are not called to run from struggle. I am so tired, and I close here, of people saying, this is the worst we've ever seen. Are you really that crazy? Have you not read some history book? Well, the certain, the current, we've never seen anything like, well, maybe you haven't, but read. You know, we, you know the country we're in? This is the country that had 250 years of slavery and 100 years of Jim Crow. You know the country we're in? This is the country where folk had to face the, 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 China, the, the harshness of the Chinese, this is Chinese uh, 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 oppression. This is the country where women couldn't vote until 1919. You know what we're in? This is, this is the country that have killed our prophet. This is, this is the place, but it's also the place where people have risen up against that. This is the place where black and white people organize against slavery. This is the country, yes, the genocide of, of indigenous people, that this is also the country where Geronimo and others fought back. This, this, this is the country where they beat people on a bridge, but they still got up and came right back. This is the country where they killed three little girls in a church. But after killing the girls, instead of killing the movement, it inspired the movement and more people came. Do you, this is the worst we've ever seen. This is the country where in, 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 in 1919, a president named Woodrow Wilson from New Jersey lied about the, lied about a virus, tried to blame it on Spanish people rather than call it what it was, the swine flu. 650,000 people died in that virus because of his lying and because of his negligence. This is a country where that same president played birth of a nation that celebrated the Klan in the Oval Office. My, my, one of my grandmother's babies died in that, that, that time from the swine flu. But this is the country also that 10 years later produced Franklin Delano Roosevelt and produced a white woman head of the labor department who was a social gospel, who said to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, we got to do minimum wage, we got to do social security. Things that a hundred years ago were seen as impossible. And Woodrow Wilson could stand straight up Frank and Delano Roosevelt had polio and could not walk. <laughs> and yet, who did God use to make the most transformation in this place we call the United States of America? It's not the worst we say, it's bad, it's not the worst. In fact, let me tell you this story and I'm through. 1857, extremists steal a seat on the Supreme Court. I'm talking about 1857, I ain't talking about what's happening now. Y'all can make the analogies you want to, but I'm talking about 1857, <clears throat> 1856. They still a seat on the Supreme Court and they deliberately put a man on the Supreme Court who's a slaveholder to guarantee that the slaveholders have the majority on the Supreme Court. His name is Tanny. He becomes Chief Justice. In 18, May, March of 1857, he presides over the, the Dred Scott decision. And the Dred Scott decision is made law. It says a black man has no rights that a white man ever has to pay attention to. 
because they're property. After that decision came down, many people said the abolition movement was over. There's nothing else we could do. That's it. Supreme Court has spoken. May of 1857, Frederick Douglass in Rochester, New York, is called to speak to the Society of Abolition and answer the question, what now? And Frederick Douglass starts out and says, this is a monstrous decision. And he says that the, the opposition that is organized against us is, is deep and powerful. The state is organized against us. The federal government is organized against us. The Supreme Court is organized against us. The, the pen and the purse, the marshals, everything is organized against us. He said an opposition organized like this will look invincible until the day it falls. And then he says, but there is another look. Yes, the Supreme Court has ruled, but there, but there is a higher court, the higher court of man's common humanity and the higher court of God. He said it, it, looked, it looked impossible too when David went out to Goliath, but take another look. And he went on and he began to just lay it out. And then he comes to this point, he says, this decision of Tanny is monstrous, but it will not stand. And he says, and he says this, he says, I meet this struggle with a cheerful spirit, Miriam, Rabbi. He says, I meet this struggle. And wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, 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 hold, hold it, Frederick, hold it, Frederick. You mean, to wait a minute, they just passed the Dred Scott decision. Basically says black folk have no rights. It, it's, it looks like slavery is now etched in forever. And you're here to tell me, you just outlined how bad it is and how organized it is. You mean to tell me you meet this with a cheerful spirit? Yes. Why? Because maybe this is the final link in the chain of events preparatory to the downfall of the whole system. Maybe this is the exposure moment. Maybe this is the moment that people see and they stand up. And so then Frederick Douglass said, and then one more thing. He said, look at history. Every attempt to stop the movement for freedom has always served to only embolden and intensify our agitation. We are not called to run from this struggle. We are called to meet it honestly, but with a cheerful spirit that the moment we end is not the last moment, nor does it have the last word. And then we are to take our place as participants for justice and not merely spectators of evil. Run to that ballot box. Vote vision, vote for a better tomorrow. Vote and say, this is not an end, this is a beginning. But if you're, if you're bothered, let everything that has happened only serve to intensify and embolden our agitation. God, we praise. God, we love. And in God, we will forever trust. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Bishop Barber. Thank you, Reverend Salguero. <clears throat> I feel like that's the call to action, right? Run to the ballot box with hope and faith um, and promise. Um, I, we were talking about we were talking about Tina Turner earlier, and for the last four years, I've been describing what's transpiring out here in our communities as sort of a Mad Max Fury Road situation. We don't quite know how to get out of this mess, um, but I love that Tina Turner song. We don't need another hero, right? We we are the heroes we've been waiting for. So and, I'm, I'm, and one of the things we have to do, I know, I know I'm, I'm cutting in, one of the no. things we have to do in this moment, particularly those of us as spiritual people, is we cannot act that like the mess just happened four years ago. That, it, that part of the discernment in this moment is to own that is, we are facing the compounding of a lot of mess that wasn't dealt with before. Which is why, if our vote now says we not after this election, we're not doing that no more. That's right. That, That's right. That would be powerful. That's right. So, just real quickly, uh, maybe um, w just a brief kind of follow up call to action. I know that we've at Faith Twenty Twenty we partnered with uh, Reverend Salguero and Nalek on their uh, voter guide. Um, Reverend Salguero, do you want to just share a little bit about what Nalek's doing in the final days of this campaign and how we can follow along and, and join in? 
Well, first, thank you. And I just want to say a hearty amen to the Reverend Dr. Barber. Uh, I can trust anybody who can mix uh, David with, with some African-American spirituals and I feel inspired. So uh, I, I will say this, uh, <laughs> Nalik is doing a few things. We're uh, getting out the vote in Pennsylvania uh, and in Florida and in a couple of swing states. Uh, we released a voter guide to our uh, over 3000 uh, congregations in our database about things that are important. I think we have to, Dr. Barber's right, have a holistic view. What are you voting on? What are the issues that are informing your election? And after you vote, whoever wins, how are you going to hold them accountable? Not just at the White House, but in statewide elections and, and city ballots and, and, and local government. And so we've been doing for several weeks as we've partnered with, with uh, Faith 2020, a get out the vote, not just in the Hispanic uh, communities, which is the communities we mostly serve, but in multi-ethnic congregations. And so... Um, you can visit our page, nalec.org, N-A-L-E-C.org, where you can uh, check, out us on, check us out on fa Facebook, National Latino Evangelical Coalition. I, I think the one of the other things is we're really, really following the lead of young people. That's Isaiah right. wasn't kidding around when he said, and, and a child shall lead them, right? right? And so from dreamers who are mostly young people to, to, to the movement against racialized violence, which is mostly uh, young people of color, but it's also incredibly multi-ethnic. It's Jewish, it's Christian, it's, it's Protestant, it's mainline, it's, it's Muslim. I think that one of the major things we're doing is making sure that, you know, every, every several minutes a Latino turns 18 in the U.S. and is able to vote to make sure that the millennials and the Gen Z's are out in great numbers. Um, and, and so that is a major push in our campaign to, to make sure that these groups who are marching well, and we thank them for marching and leading on these issues of racialized violence, of dreamers, of immigration, and of criminal justice reform, so forth, on poverty. But now, now it's beyond the march. You need to, we need to march these young people down to the voting booth and make sure they got registered and voted. So I want to put out a word of applause. Sometimes they put some of us older people uh, like myself, Dr. Barber looks much younger than me and Rabbi looks much younger than the both of us, but young people, young people, young people, young people, let's keep working with them. And hasn't that always been the case that they've always been there? And I love that Pentecostal scripture in Acts that says your old men are for uh, your, your, your sons and your daughters, you know, that old men are for, for wisdom and war and young men for vision and young women for vision. I think it's bringing it all together. You know, in this moment, Mo Moses and Joshua can walk together. Paul and Timothy can actually walk walk together. Uh, Miriam and those young girls that she was training, they can all walk together. And and we have to, and we have to say to folk, listen, we're clear. You, 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 you make a practical decision in every election. And then after the election, you push people. And one of the things you, you vote for in an election is who in fact you can push to carry out the agenda. Particularly if you know someone is, is diametrically opposed. But I, you know we have so much untapped power. And we gotta say that to folks. That, that's, that's that point about spectator. 100 million people didn't vote last time. Who sits in the presidency by 80,000 votes? Come on, y'all. Come on, y'all. You know, the, in the Senate right now, the, the people that control the judiciary come from the least popular state, states, but also the states that, that vote the least. Um, um, when the commentators tell now, I can't believe Georgia and Mississippi are in play. I knew they were. We've been saying that in the Poor People's Campaign. You know, we've done 2 million calls already to poor low wealth voters in eight states that were that were so-called non-battleground states. And now people saying they're battleground states. A battleground state is where you do battle. <laughs> That's what makes it a battleground state. And the fact of the matter is most of those states are not red or blue. They're unorganized, they're not voting, and they're people where uh, a lot of times that people haven't spoken to their issues. And a lot of times where even we in the church have not just lifted up the basic moral principles of the scripture, not told people to vote Republican or, or Democrat, but just help sear the consciousness. Well, we don't have to do that anymore. And, and I want folk to hear that we have power, all this untapped power, it's time to unleash it, unleash it, unleash it, unleash it, unleash it. Do not let these forces have the last word. Unleash this power. Do not allow 80,000 votes to rule 100 million. Come on, y'all, don't allow that. The math is off. 
The rationale is off. Don't say what people are doing to us. Say what we can do and what we must do. And if we do, we don't even know. I, I tell folks, Obama stole my line. I, I declare he got it off a tweet because I had put it out just before he said it. And that is, uh, we don't know what America would look like if people vote. Because even when Obama ran, 40% of black folk didn't vote. Come on. <laughs> even like, we, you know, we don't know what a 75% vote would look like. We don't, uh, we don't know what it would really look like if we maximize. So I believe like Reverend Gabe, let's find out. Let's find out. I'm, I'm strange like that. If the Lord say he can work miracles sometimes, let's find out. Let's, let's see. <laughs> you know, let's let's get on the water, Peter. He says, come, get out there and walk toward it. <laughs> you know, but for God's sake, do not keep sitting back talking about what folk are doing to us. We are not spectators. We do have power and we need to run toward this struggle. And if you want to do any Fort Worth next three days, www.poorpeoplescampaign.org. And uh, Reverend Liz is right there in New York. She can tell you the same thing. We still have room for people to call, do peer texting, uh, and still move move this vote out. So you can join in, www.poorpeoplescampaign.org. And Reverend gave you exactly right. Young people are leading that effort with us. I told them I'm almost an elder now. I'm almost 60. My job is to give some counsel, but, but it's time for them to step up and step out and for us to be, and not, and not wait till we're dead. And then they take our place. I want some folk to take my place while I'm living so I can celebrate. I don't want to be dead somewhere. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Thank you, Reverend Thank you so Barber. Fred. Well, I want to thank everyone. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Reverend Barber, uh, Reverend Segaro, uh, Rabbi Corbin, uh, for taking time uh, to uh, be with us, to get the word out, to encourage people uh, to to go to the polls, to vote, to vote their hopes over their fears. I want to thank uh, you, Adam, Reverend Phillips, for uh, leading this effort. Um, you know, this is the culmination of these virtual roundtables that we started back, I think, in January, even before COVID hit. And I can't think of a more fitting way to bring it to a close uh, than to have these three leaders uh, to... Uh, to call us to uh, to this higher calling, to call us to get out, uh, get involved, not sit on the sidelines, um, and uh, in the boat. So I want to encourage everybody with them earshot of my voice. Please vote, go vote, Adam. Thank you all so much. Uh, like the bishop, like the Reverend Doctor said, we've got to get all of our people out to vote. Um, voting uh, ends on Tuesday, right? We've been voting for a couple of weeks. I voted last week in, in Portland, Oregon. So a mask up, get that hand sanitizer going, get out, knock on doors, text your friends, send the video that, of this uh, event that we will put up on uh, Facebook and through email, uh, send that to your, your communities, your congregations, and make sure that folks know that the vote is, is a sacred act, as John Lewis uh, told us. We're going to close with um, a video to that end, 90 second video um, as our sort of benediction sent to us from friend Dr. Martha Eddy. Um, you may have seen Henry Louis Gates has been sharing it online. Um, it's a very powerful um, interpretation of the preamble uh, and it helps us see what's really uh, at stake, I think. Again, uh, my name is Reverend Adam Phillips with Faith 2020. Very grateful for Reverend Salguero, Rabbi Hilbrin. Um, Bishop Barber and uh, Reverend uh, Fred Davey, my friend at Union Theological Seminary. Um, join us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Faith 2020 US, and join us in choosing hope over fear. Let's get the job done on November 3rd. As we know, the work will continue after the election, but we got to get to November 3rd first. <laughs> Blessings, be safe, and we'll let this video be our, our closing word. Thank you.
Adam, we don't have volume. So sorry about that. I'll drop the link in the chat and then we'll share it on our Facebook. Love and light, be safe. Sounds great, peace. Vote. Um, yes, indeed, bye-bye.